Hey there, it's your co-host Sid. And this is your co-host Sharfos. We know that job search is a difficult process. It can be frustrating, it's hard to network, find the right fit for yourself, and it can be a very lonely journey. Here at Careers on Court, we're trying to bridge that journey and have amazing conversations with people. And we want to welcome you to our episode today. Shafuz, how's it going? You look like you're reading off a script in that intro. <laughs> <laughs> hey, 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 let's just assume that it was from my heart. It was like, I thought I, thought I really enunciated the words right there. I thought it was really good. Then. Okay. But I, I like that intro. So this is like our launch of our, our new intro video, which is pretty yeah. cool. I think we did a better job there, Sid. Happy Saturday. How, uh, how, how's it going, man? How's, how are you? So, I mean, it's been like this for the past few weeks. I ran out of my favorite coffee. So today I moved to French vanilla, which is not as good. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's not as good as hazelnut. How yeah, about you? Funny, it's good. Like, I'm, still at my, I'm still at Moss's place in North Carolina, just visiting. Uh, funny story there. I got Pete's coffee the other day um, in Boston. Mm -hmm. I, I have a coffee machine. But the thing is, I don't think of, among all my skills, reading labels is one of my big <laughs> skills. So I did not read that it was actually beans, like ground beans and not ground coffee. Yeah. So when I put that on my coffee machine, it didn't work. And I was really upset. It was actually because for that, you need something else. So it's something I learned in life that college didn't teach me. Wow, that's, so, that's absolutely crazy. So, you know, so you ground, just walk back to Pete's and then they'll grind it for you. <laughs> yeah, like, so coffee beans and ground coffee, not the same thing. It took me, uh -huh. I was this year's old when I learned that. So, All right, let's let's talk about that. Let's let's hear. Actually, you want to bring him on and hear his take on coffee? Yeah, why don't we bring him on? Um, like, what's his like? What's his favorite coffee? Like, let's ask him. Hey, Pat, how's it going? Pat, you're on mute. That's the classic pandemic thing. Joining in, like, <laughs> hey, what's up? And then you're on mute. <laughs> How are you guys? <laughs> It's, it's, it's good, well. Pat. Um, thanks for joining us today. First question, Pat, what's your favorite coffee and how do you feel about ground coffee versus coffee beans? Uh, my favorite coffee is, is cold brew. I've actually been making a lot of coffee at home. And so I got this yeah. massive mason jar. So I love just making like a huge thing of cold brew in the morning. Yeah. A little oat milk, a little cold brew gets me going. Uh, I like both coffee beans and ground coffee, but you kind of need to have ground coffee if you want to eventually drink it. So, I mean, I, I appreciate the coffee bean, but if I could only have one, I, I would choose the ground coffee. Yeah, no, absolutely, I feel there. Um, and quick, I know we like, we just do this intro with our guests. So I think since I had the chance to sleep with Pat uh, from my time in Rochester, I think there's this one about him is that I, I met Pat when I was in as a first year in Rolfar. Uh, to Argo, um, well, uh, we miss Argo. It's been a while, um, and I think Pat, one cool thing about you is you went to Bangladesh, so that's something, it. something really awesome. I definitely want to hear a bit about that uh, sometime, and uh, we could compare how Bangladesh is like much better place to visit than India, and you could join me on that. Uh, I don't know if I want to take sides on that debate. I love both countries very much. Shafuz is making this a very right. political conversation, I see. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's kick it off, Sid. All right, Pat. So let's get us started with uh, some of your hobbies. What do you like doing outside of work? Uh, I love playing video games during the pandemic. It's been a little dangerous, you know, sitting down pretty much in the same spot all day, both for work and for entertainment. But I think I've managed to limit myself fairly well. Uh, I like cooking as well. Uh, I just mm -hmm. moved into a new place. I was in this really tiny Manhattan one bedroom with kind of like an awful kitchen, you know, electric stove. There's a fire alarm right over it. So if you want to do anything above like medium temperature, that thing would go off. So I couldn't really cook at all. But now I moved into this place in Brooklyn has a massive kitchen, dishwasher, huge stove. So I've been cooking like a ton of meals. So that's been a, one of my big pandemic uh, hobbies as well that I've discovered. That is so awesome. That sounds like the dream. Uh, what is uh, What is one of the video games you're playing right now? Play a lot of League of Legends. I think that's a, a classic, you know, yeah. male, early 20s, mid 20s. League of Legends yeah. just has to happen. Right. Although Call of Duty sprinkled in as well. So nothing too creative, unfortunately. Just like <laughs> the classic big ones. But, you know, there's a reason they're so big, right? The most fun. <laughs> yeah. Very oh, true. Yeah. 
yeah no for sure pat i think uh with the with, with your new cooking hobby I, i hope you're like kind of touching upon some of the bengali cuisines and those recipes um, mm, i haven't gotten there yet but if you have any uh you would recommend i would love to uh to try them out instead of my life okay we'll, we'll we'll touch base upon that after this call <laughs> <laughs> very important <laughs> um but yeah pat um super excited to have you with us today on this saturday and i think one of the things we want to kind of hear about is that um you it's been like uh three years since you graduated if i'm not wrong yeah. 20 yeah, yeah three. okay and that was, that was such a guess wow that worked um <laughs> uh so what were uh when you look back at college right what are some of the most significant experiences that stand out to you some of the experiences that stand out to me uh mm. that's a good question i i would think you know the the classes i took were definitely important i learned a lot from them i uh, learned a lot how to, how to think um you know how to approach problems how to work hard you know apply myself but i think the most impactful experiences were the activities i chose to belong to so when i think of one for example i think mock trial and joining the mock yeah. trial club was probably the most impactful experience for me it gave me a lot of personal exposure because i thought i wanted to be a lawyer for a bit so it gave me a great way to kind of explore what that would actually be like you know what lawyers do what it would be like to mm-hmm. actually go to a trial and you know prepare like an argument argue it in front of a judge yeah. and it gave me a lot of um at least for me like public speaking experience as well mm-hmm. which i think is really important you know just cuz you know I was yeah. a pretty shy person so it was really a nice way for me to kind of come out of my shell and yeah. also for you know just like interview experience you know the, yeah. having that sort of like communication training you know I, yeah. every time i went into an interview i was always nervous but in my mind i always tried to treat it as like another mock trial speech so it kind of mm-hmm. like my mock trial presentation persona going so i think that that experience helped me to develop a lot of my communication skills as well yeah really yeah i'm glad like some of the skills you're using them right now i'm glad it worked out yeah it just even you know day to day like communication is i think one of the <laughs> biggest things that people um don't really think about when they mm-hmm. think about you know what what's important to succeed in the workplace in an interview and i think a lot of times like like for example an analysis group and we interview people you know people can be smart and they can be you know really good at math or quantitative skills or really good at research but if you can't communicate those ideas you have and you can be Einstein mm-hmm. but you can't tell people what you're thinking or what you're doing then it just doesn't yeah. matter so i think that's something that is kind of underrated from the students perspective as well mm-hmm. yeah no absolutely i think Yeah and we and we've heard this a lot also and I'm glad you mentioned this like how important communication skills is and it's I guess mm-hmm. no no classes can teach you that right it's something you kind of learn by yourself and a lot of through, through get, getting into some other experiences so glad you yeah. mentioned that um I guess so one thing um, we're going to talk a lot more about analysis group uh, but I guess one thing I'm curious about is like um in your college like are did you have summer internships uh how did you sort of um approach that finding internships during the summer because that's one of the things we see a lot of current students struggle mm-hmm. with a lot what was kind of walk us through a little bit about that experience sure sure uh so my internship experience i had two so i had one my sophomore to junior year and then one my junior to senior year i think mm-hmm. if you can get one freshman to sophomore year uh it's great you know you should yeah. but don't be you know pressuring yourself too much i think for a lot of industries it's it's kind of early and people don't really expect to see that so i actually just went back and i continued shining shoes that summer that was my summer job uh, that was until the <laughs> sophomore to junior year and i had my first internship so that was with the attorney general's office actually mm-hmm. in new york city so i was working with the civil rights bureau as a data analyst so what mm-hmm. that was was like um for example have you guys heard of the term redlining uh can't say that so redlining no. is this practice where uh, a bank who might give out mortgages specifically says okay we are not going to give mortgages to people in these communities more often uh, communities that are majority minority the term goes so a lot of minority mm-hmm. communities so the bank said okay we're not going to get involved there so the attorney general uh, would get involved that's in legal practice And so I spent a lot of my summer there doing uh, a redlining case so we would look at like census data and compare it to where these banks were were loaning and try to put together this you know story that you know if you look at this well coincidentally 
you guys completely just go around all these majority minority um, mm. communities. And how I approached getting into that was at the time, you know, through my mock trial experience, I was thinking still at that point that I wanted to be a lawyer, but I wasn't really sure. And I had a lot of, um, you know, statistics, kind of a data analysis experience because I was a, a math and economics major. So I thought right. that that was a good way to kind of do both at once. You know, I've got this thing that I can actually, you know, do. I can go in Excel, you know, run these formulas, whatever. But it's a good way to get exposure to, you know, some of the law side as well. Um, it wasn't really a, a specific story. It's actually kind of funny. I, I learned about this position because my ex-girlfriend was applying to some sort of similar roles. So she showed me what she was applying for at the attorney general and I was just scrolling through their website and I just applied to it randomly and I got a call one day. Uh, so I think my, my approach there was just keeping an open mind, you know, not really saying like, oh man, I need this specific internship. It was just yeah. applying for a bunch of things and that was one that hit. Yeah, no, that's really cool. Uh, just like, I guess you sort of like kept an old, open net and like you wanted to like try out different things and you didn't have like a specific thing in mind initially at the early stage. Yeah. And that's kind of the the theme of the, you know, discovering your your passion one step at a time. I think I always kind of kept an open mind. I never thought I really needed to specifically have XYZ experience or XYZ prestigious internship to, yeah. to really make it. It was just yeah. I always tried new things and, and saw what I could learn from them. And so my takeaway from that summer was that Hey, you know, I actually don't want to be a lawyer. Uh, I really do like the the data analysis. I think I'm more of a numbers guy. So yeah. let me try to do something more like that. So the next summer, I ended up doing an internship with AIG, the insurance company. Mm -hmm. uh, funnily enough, I was a couple blocks away in the financial district from my old place. So I ran into some of the attorney general lawyers just like out in the street doing lunch. Like, hey, guys, what's up? I'm back again. <laughs> So at that point, I was more thinking like a career in finance. Uh, I ended up not getting like another internship. I was applying, you know, like every U of R kid to some of the JP Morgan positions that, you know, Gwen sort of brought in. Didn't get any of those, but you know, life didn't end. You know, you don't always get your first choice and that's fine. So I did this attorney, this internship with AIG and that was another great experience. I was in the commercial FP&A team. So mm -hmm. their commercial insurance, you know, providing insurance to you know, industries such as something like um, business interruption insurance, something that has definitely come, you know, to the forefront during the pandemic. You know, if all of a sudden you can't operate your business for whatever reason, then AIG is going to make payouts for you. Or say your factory was hit by a hurricane and your hurricane, yeah. you know, the, the factory is, you know, completely wiped out. I think there was a specific term for that, like a like a specific term for like a really big disaster event. And funnily enough, AIG always said, well, if you put aside these big disaster events, we had a great quarter, but if you include those, we lost like a hundred billion dollars. But for whatever reason, they always didn't include these major disaster events. I mean, I guess it makes sense because you can't really like account and, and predict them as much yeah. as like the smaller events. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, so that was the team I was working in. So it was a lot more like, in depth working with Excel, you know, financial models, mm. you know, FP&A stuff, so like classic uh, corporate finance things as well, looking at key like ratios in the business and the industry. Uh, yeah, so it wasn't my first choice, but I I got it. It was a good position. Uh, I learned a lot, and so I had this kind of mindset. You know, I need to show up, work hard every day, get as much out of it. You know, make sure I return. I secure the return offer, even if it's not something I necessarily feel like would love doing. And I ended up getting a lot out of it. You know, it's a really cool industry. I can definitely see myself getting back into it one day. Uh, but my takeaway, again, at the end of it was this was cool, but kind of commercial uh, corporate finance isn't really what I want to get into. Um, so I learned a lot. And it was a good experience, but time to take that and, and move on to the next thing. Right, right. No, that's that's really cool. Uh, you sort of, I, and I guess that's what a part of an internship should be, right? It should also like tell you what you don't want to do. Uh, exactly. As, as, yeah. So, um, and I'm glad that you kind of knew that you didn't like kind of give into it. Like you had it, but you, not necessarily what you wanted to do. But you wanted to like also like strive for what you really want to do, which is kind of cool. Like a lot of people wouldn't want to ping that extra mile. So yeah, yeah. I, I think it's really important to you know whatever position you find yourself in to always be open to new experiences because it's it's always the stuff that you don't really think you would like or you know not really sure you you get into. You know, you just have to 
know, try hard, give it a mm-hmm. really good shot, an actual honest college try. And yeah. sometimes it doesn't work out and you learn something about yourself and say, okay, this was great. Um, but it's not what I want to do. And then sometimes you try it and you're like, Hey, you know, surprisingly, this is amazing. This is what I want to get into. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. So that my question to you is what was sort of your mindset going into senior year? So you had this internship you're, uh, with AIG the year before, what mm-hmm. was it like? What were you thinking? Um, so around halfway through the internship with AIG, I kind of realized, you know, this isn't really what I want to get into. Um, so the process kind of started, you know, mid that summer where I knew that, especially for the sort of stuff I'd be interested in, you know, it, it would kind of you know hit the ground running as soon as the semester started. So I was like, okay, man, like I got to get started like ASAP thinking like what I want to do. So the first step was, was like reflection, like, okay, I've, I've tried a few things at this point. None of them really stuck, you know, the lawyer thing, not really that, but I did enjoy that internship, you know, AIG thing. I enjoyed the experience. I enjoyed kind of like putting together the Excel financial models, stuff like that, but the industry specifically, you know, the type of work environment, excuse me, wasn't really what I was looking to get into. So I was like, okay, I like these things. I don't like these things. And I had actually met um, during the first summer, the sophomore to junior year summer, at one of the U of R recruiting events, uh, I met this guy, uh, Mike Diamond, who mm-hmm. worked at Analysis Group. And so, you know, a big part of it is also networking as well. So meeting people, talking with them, making these connections. And at the time when I was talking with him, you know, Analysis Group wasn't really on my radar. Mm-hmm. I just saw his name on like the sheet of alumni that were gonna be there. I was like, hey, this looks kind of cool. So I talked to him for five minutes. Um, and then that was that, I, I never talked to him again after that. Uh, until the next summer. And I was like, hey, you know, now that I kind of have more experience, I kind of know like what this is gonna be more about, you know, I think economic consulting would be maybe a pretty good fit. So I reached back out to Mike, I uh, got a beer with him and, you know, we talked and I, I started to think more like, hey, this is something I'd actually really be interested in. Um, so that was one of my options going into senior year. Mm-hmm. And so when I got back to campus, I was like, okay, I've got the AIG offer, but that's not really what I'll get into. I was kind of more focused on consulting, I think specifically. Mm-hmm. One of the big takeaways I had from the AIG experience was that I liked doing the sort of analytical work they did, but I think in that sort of FP&A, like very specific role, you kind of become an expert, you know, obviously, in commercial insurance. Mm-hmm. And I was like, commercial insurance is cool, but I don't want to be an expert mm-hmm. in commercial insurance. What I really like is learning about something and, you know, helping, you know, applying some experience that I learned and then, you know, adding value and moving on. So I was like, okay, I'm, I think consulting would be a good fit for me. So I was looking at economic and management consulting roles. Mm-hmm. So that's what I was focused on as I got back to campus. So it was just applying for a bunch of these positions. Analysis group was one of those positions, did the interview, et cetera. Gotcha. That's pretty awesome. So just for our audience here and also for my knowledge, what uh, what sort of is economic consulting? Like what sectors fit in there? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. It, it's a really niche industry. So when you think of consulting, you usually think of management consulting, which is, you know, say you own a company and you're like, mm-hmm. hey, I, I've got problems with my sales. You know, how can I turn it around? Or I want to implement this this new technology. So it's working with a company to help them solve kind of an ongoing business problem. Problem. Mm-hmm. Economic consulting is a little different. Uh, it's more academic mm-hmm. is a word that people used to describe it a lot. And the reason is because you're not working directly with the company, usually you're working in a litigation context. So what that means is, say for example, Shark Foods, you own a business, mm-hmm. you hire Sid to you know, maybe upgrade one of your warehouses and Sid blows it up. Unfortunately, you didn't have commercial business interruption uh, insurance through AIG, but you still have one asset, which is you can sue Sid and make him pay you. So you sue him, and you know the question is, Sid has to pay you damages, and how yeah. much of damages should Sid have to pay you? And that's a question that you might hire a company like Analysis Group to figure out. So we do a lot of economic and financial analysis in litigation situations. And often we're looking at things that happened actually in the past and trying to figure out 
why those things happened, what were the drivers, who was harmed, how much were they harmed, and how much should that person maybe have to pay back. And so it's a broad range of things like that. So it's not just um, you know damages analysis. It's stuff like you know antitrust. You hear a lot about Apple and Google. Mm -hmm. You know yeah. what what is what is market power. You know how much is okay under current antitrust frameworks. So a lot of times it's working with you know an economics professor who may be an antitrust expert, mm -hmm. and you know doing whatever is you know the acceptable industry standard analysis to determine you know when is market power you know. When does it cross a line? When does it go too far? And then applying that to the specific case context. So I think to sum it up, economic consulting works in applying economic and financial. Um, I guess that ideas or analyses to real world situations more often than not in a litigation situation, but not necessarily. Gotcha. I think that was a great example yeah. of uh, Shafu suing me. I think that you really hit the I, bullseye right there. <laughs> maybe uh, I, a little bit of a prophecy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I mean, if I had seen as a consultant, I wouldn't expect anything more of him than screw it up. So that would make sense. <laughs> he would definitely blow things up. But yeah. that was such a no, that was such a great example, Pat. I love it. I guess um and I I guess one follow-up question I have there, Pat, is that um so like for economics consulting right can you talk about some of the other industries so you guys work with is it like a lot more government oriented like do you guys have a lot of government clients in that sense um and i guess another question is that uh okay no that's my first question let's start with that <laughs> i blanked out my second question <laughs> um yeah yeah the, the clients are are really varied um there's mm -hmm. just a, a ton of different you know practice areas it, right. Really, I think a, a good example is it, it's sim similar structure to a law firm. So you've got different partners with different um, specialties in different areas. So yeah. some people, you know, they work with you know government disputes. Mm -hmm. Some people, especially in the New York office, you know, just because of where we are in the financial capital of this country, we do a lot of finance cases. So more often than not, that's going to take the form of a commercial dispute between two parties. But sometimes it can be, you know, some cases we worked on are, are like spoofing cases where the government might say, hey, you know, we think that this firm has, you know, done this illegal trading practice analysis group, help us analyze this data to, to see, you know, did their trading patterns, you know, illegally impact the stock price, for example. Uh, so there are a lot of government clients. Um, for me personally, I think just through the New York office, we've worked a lot with uh, commercial clients, so uh, business to business litigation. Gotcha. That makes that makes more sense. Yeah, it's really cool. Yeah, for sure. So that my last question to you is: What are some things of the job that you really really enjoy, and what are some of the sort of not so good things about uh, working at the analysis group? Sure. Uh, I love the exposure you get. You, uh, you everyone in an analysis group is a generalist. So what that means, well, at the at the analyst level, so you come in as a generalist. So what that means is you're not put into a specific bucket like Pat. You're only going to work on these finance cases. So I love the ability to work on a bunch of different cases. You know, I've worked on government bankruptcies, intellectual property disputes, you know, M and A sort of work, stuff like that, uh, mm -hmm. securities fraud. So I, I love being able to get exposure to a lot of different things, mm -hmm. learn a lot of different things. And I think that's helped me, you know, in terms of, you know, discovering your passions. I'm not sure what's next, but I think that sort of exposure is something that I really found valuable and something that, that has helped me, you know, think about what I want to do next mm -hmm. in my career. So I think that's one of the best things. Another thing is the, the people and the culture. It, yeah. It's really excellent. Uh, it's a very team-based, very communicative environment. Everyone wants you to succeed. Everyone wants you to do well. Everyone wants you to develop. And people that are just um, nice, you know, there's no gunners, no one's ever going to try to steal the, you know, your credit for something. If anything, people, you know, give me too much credit, <laughs> but I always yeah. joke with uh, one of the associates on a case I'm working on, you know, in the meetings with um, the senior members of the team, she'll always be like, you know, and Pat is such an expert in this model. He did such a good job. I'm like, I'm not that much of an expert. You know, I don't know too <laughs> much. Like, don't call me an expert. Yeah, uh, but 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 the culture there is is really great. So just in terms of nice people to work with who want to see you succeed 
and develop. And, you know, my, my advisor is always like, right, how can I get you on more cases that you want to be on? How, like, what, what are you looking for? How can I help you get there? You know, what do you, where do you want to be at this point? Um, so I think the, the exposure and the culture is really excellent. Uh, yep. There's also great snacks in the office. Oh, not, really, <laughs> not really as applicable now anymore, unfortunately. Right. I'm my own LaCroix. Um, <laughs> some of the things I don't like as much, sometimes the schedule can be a little hectic. Uh, mm. I think like with all consulting, it's, it's very come and go. So right mm. now I'm in kind of a downtime where I'm honestly not that busy. But mm. the issue is even though there's other work to, to do, like other cases, I can't get on that stuff because the stuff I'm on now is going to be busy next week, maybe, who knows? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like a, a reserve on my time. So sometimes you know you don't have too much to do. And then sometimes right before a deadline, you've got a little too much to do and, and you know the hours can get a little late. Uh, but that comes with the industry. Yeah. And I think, uh, especially now, another thing I don't like as much you know, as a third realist is I feel like I've kind of you know, matured, I'm ready to, to move on to the next step in the management ladder. So sometimes, you know, there's, there's tasks that are just kind of like a little mundane, but, you know, at the end of the day, these are the things that have to get done. Mm -hmm. um, no one likes every single aspect of their job. There's always yeah. tedious yeah. tasks to do. Um, so you just got to um, roll up your sleeves and do it. You can't really complain. Would I like to not do those things? No. And sometimes there are some tedious <laughs> things to do, but that's just the way it is and really whatever work whatever career path you're going to get into right sure yeah no for sure i think uh that's a yeah i think i think my manager was also telling me the other day as well like about half of your job is like doing all the things you don't like to do there's like a lot of grunt work and you kind of want to <laughs> go through them to do all the more exciting stuff so i think, I think a lot of yeah i think a lot of college students don't sort of get that unless they get into the industry there's like a very romanticized version of these careers right like being a consultant mm -hmm. and things like that um and speaking of which i do have a short follow-up question pat is that sure. uh, i i remember like uh during college an analysis group was uh, a really really hyped up company and you far and like a lot of students like really like try to explore opportunities there especially in economics consulting and i've noticed a lot of econ students sort of my, as myself as well sort of kind of explore that more so do you think there's like some skills either if it's academics or some sort of a background which is more suited for consulting like a place like analysis group compared to a normal other kind of consulting that we're more used to would you say there's like an ideal background for per se yeah i can tell you just pretty much basically what what we look for when we hire the analyst level um out of college uh, i think one of the first things yeah. is high gpa uh, especially because our work is kind of a little more academic. We look for people who, you know, more more often than not are economics majors, though that's certainly not a disqualifying factor if you're not. We hire non-econ majors all the time. But because, you know, we're doing a lot of economics work, if you are an econ major and you've got a high GPA, means you enjoy your economics classes, you're good at them. So that's kind of one of the big factors we look at. So GPA, mm -hmm. you got to keep that up if you're looking to get in the industry. Uh, communication skills is another big one. Uh, that's going to come across more in the interview, but it's kind of along this lines of, you know, we can teach an analyst how to do the Excel modeling. We can teach them how to write a nice memo, but, you know, if they can't communicate an idea, well, that's, that's a little harder. And I think mm -hmm. another big thing um, to help you stand out in your you know, cover letter and application, you just know what economic consulting is. I think a lot of times people are confused because it is more of a niche industry. Um, so yeah. I can't tell you how many cover letters I've read that are like, yeah, you know, I really want to get into management consulting, and I, I'm excited for this group. I'm like, well, if you want to get into <laughs> management consulting, this isn't the place. So just differentiating in your cover letter that you know what economic consulting is. Yeah, working, you know, with the more often than not in a litigation context, working with expert witnesses to help them develop expert reports for these lawsuits, stuff like that. That's a big one. So to summarize, mm -hmm. it's you know GPA key. Um, communication skills, that's more for the interview, uh, knowing what economic consulting is. And I think another trend we're looking at is we have seen a lot of uh, coding in our cases. So if you do have any statistical coding experience, uh, like with the more classic SAS or Stata, or even with Python or other programming languages, that's another boost to your resume that we see. That's really cool. Um, thanks for explaining that in such good details. I think I'm glad I asked you this 
I finally realized why I never got an interview at the agency. <laughs> that <laughs> wasn't my fault, Jeffries. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, I, 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 but I, I, everything is clear now. Why I never got the interview in the first place, huh? <laughs> I'm glad I asked. <laughs> That was yeah. just a selfish question you tossed in there. I just wanted, I just wanted to know, man. I just wanted to know why I never got an interview. <laughs> yeah, and I think yeah. another thing I can, I can add there is one thing that is nice about the industry is it's a little more egalitarian than like management yeah. consulting. You know, if you want to get into a top management consulting firm, usually you do kind of have to know someone there if you're not at a target yeah. school, and usually U of R is not a target school for a lot of these places. Uh, but yeah. my experience, I think, you know, I, I had a good GPA, economic consulting was, so I wrote that in my cover letter, and I had some sort of coding experience. So, you know, I just went to, you know, vault.com, economic consulting, ran, you know, moved down the list, applied. And I, I heard back from a lot of places where I just didn't know anyone. It was just a random application through the portal. So I think that that is one of the pieces of news about it, where it's not necessarily driven so much by your contacts, but rather by your personal ability, which is kind of nice. Especially for a school like Rochester, which doesn't always have, you know, the best contacts for these companies. True. Yeah. No, for sure. I think that's such a great point there. Um, yeah, no, Pat, thanks for sort of walking us through your experience with at AG and sort of giving us a little bit of the inside scoop there. Um, I think I um, I think another uh, the other big part of our conversation today that we're really excited about, which is sort of the angle of the topic how to discover your passion and i mm -hmm. think this is something we hear a lot about but it doesn't get talked about as much because students are always like okay what 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 are we doing with career wise there's academics but then it's also like what are you passionate about so i guess to kick things off with that when you look back at college what were the things that you did to find out what you were passionate about overall yeah I think a lot of it is is the stuff we talked about, you know, in terms of like career passions. You know, I won't tell you about my passion for for video games, although that is another topic <laughs> we could fill an hour on easily. Um, <laughs> but you know, doing stuff like like mock trial, like I, I never thought I wanted to be a lawyer. Uh, it's actually a funny story. Freshman year, kid on my hall comes up to me, he's like, "Oh, come on, come into this this general interest meeting with me." I'm like, oh, no, I don't really want to. And he's like, oh, I hear there's a lot of girls there. I'm like, I, I can check it out. I can see what's going on with my child. Uh, and, it, you know, I never thought I wanted to be a lawyer. It was never on my radar, but it seemed kind of cool for me. So I just, I went for it and I, I stuck with it. And, you know, same thing kind of going into college and I thought I was going to be a, a doctor. And that was the plan. And it came time to sign up for classes and it was like biology, chemistry. And I just asked myself, can you really see yourself doing this? And the answer is no. So I just kind of followed my interests, you know, economics. I didn't really know what it was going to take me. Um, so I think a, a big part of it is doing stuff, even if it's not necessarily what you think is the best for your, your career at the moment, and just kind of going with it. I think a lot of kids you know, at the U of R and, and other places, and they focus on, I got to get this, this internship. I got to get this job. And a lot of times, and I know from my experience, you're going into internships and jobs. You don't even know what that position is really until you mm -hmm. start. Like in Alice, I had like a good idea of what economic consulting was, but I didn't really know until I started the job. So don't be so focused on the end result, but be focused on kind of really listening to like your inner self, because it's something I'm interested in. So I think it was, you know, mock trial, trying something, even though it wasn't something I considered before. It was going into these random internships that wasn't really sure and being honest with myself and saying that, you know, this isn't exactly what I'm looking for, but this is something I've, I've learned from myself from these experiences. Uh, yeah, so mock trial, the internships, you know, just mm -hmm. taking classes that I thought were interesting, doing projects that I thought were interesting, uh, stuff like that. Yeah, well, no, that's a, that's a really good input. Yeah, I remember like you being some kind of a legend in mock trial back in the back when you were at school. I, yeah, I, heard, I, mean, I, I, I peaked in college with on the mock <laughs> trial team. So it's just been downhill from there. <laughs> you picked it, yeah. I, guess, I think I, I I never went to a mock trial meeting, but I heard like I heard just I, I the word kind of flew around of your like legendary some some stories, man. So that's that's something. Um, I, I guess like so. And um, this might sound a little meta, and I don't um, I don't think that's the right word to describe it. But um, you mentioned mock trials, internships, and um, 
about how you realize those were your passion. So I guess the question here is that, you know, when you're a student, you're doing all these things, right? You're doing, maybe you have other club activities as well, classes that you, some, you're, you care about to some degrees. What do you think is a good framework that may have worked for you to sort of know this is actually what I'm passionate about or this is what I'm doing just because I have to? Um, mm -hmm. Like, do you think there is something, uh, there's a way to figure it out if it's, if it's passion or if it's just I'm doing because I have to? Is something like that click for you? It's a good question. I, I don't think there's a specific framework. I think what really helped me was I just, you know, I stopped it and asked myself if I was actually enjoying what I was doing or just take me on too much. And, and there were times where, you know, it, it's just so easy to, to get caught up in doing mm -hmm. things. I think especially at a, a school like the U of R where there's pressure to, to do like five different clubs, there's pressure to overload and, and really crush yourself so that, that you're so busy just, you know, sustaining, getting through the next problem set, getting through the next exam. Yeah. That you don't like pause to kind of reflect uh, on a more macro level. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and that there's times that happened to me too where I remember one of my advisors for an organization, I took on this like philanthropy role and I was just so busy that semester that I didn't do anything. I, I literally just had that role and I did nothing with it. And so he suggested I go to this workshop that the school was hosting. And yep. the, the theme of the workshop was, it was like how to, how to manage your time. I'm like, oh great, this is really gonna be helpful for me. And yeah. you get there and pretty much the whole theme of the workshop was, if you're having trouble managing your time, you're probably doing too much. So ask yourself, of the things you're doing, what's what's really important? What do you really enjoy? And what are you just doing because you know you felt like you had to do? And so that like philanthropy role, I, I love philanthropy, but that role I wasn't really committed to. I didn't really feel an attachment to. I wasn't really doing anything. And so I just dropped it and I felt better. So I think a, a big, a helpful goal, a good framework is, you know, you have to, you know, get caught up and, you know, survive, do the problem set, study for the exam, but take some time to reflect. Are these classes really what I'm interested in? You know, mm -hmm. is this going to help me with my long-term goals? You know, do I need to start applying for internships now? Uh, am I yeah. procrastinating? You know, even if I'm super busy, is this something that I need to prioritize? You know, I may do a little less well on this exam, but if I end up getting a better internship, then that's going to be more helpful for my career. So maybe I need to reprioritize a little bit. So I don't think there's a general framework. It just you know take some time to stop, reflect. Is what I'm doing helping me towards my long-term goals? Is what I'm doing something I'm really interested in, or is it something that I'm not, and I would be better off without? Yeah, no, I uh, that that's super cool. I think a good takeaway for me is that like just like stopping and reflecting. I feel like college i was running on a clock and jumping from one homework to the next homework mm -hmm. and realizing I, I i just missed my deadline so it's really mm -hmm. um it's really hard to take a pause and think about that to do the do that reflection um i don't know said did you think what you figured out what you were passionate about in college i mean you spent quite some time there <laughs> <laughs> you went to two different colleges right <laughs> you're in albany first <laughs> no, I spent four years in college like normal people. I didn't spend. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, uh, I forgot you. You in two colleges, yeah. Forget. Yeah, it. but no, I definitely did find an area of interest. It took me a long time. I think it was junior year around then. That's when I sort of discovered what I wanted to do. I was sort of just thrown into like computer science is the way to go because you'll end up making money. Um, <laughs> that quickly changed. I was like, ah, I don't really. I don't think I can do this. <laughs> yeah. No, I think that's uh, yeah. That, I think that's very kind of very relevant to a lot of us and like how students also perceive this. Um, so I guess Pat, here's another question uh, that I have: is that, um, in your opinion, like, so, what do you think could be like a difference of somebody who sort of did not really figure out their passion as much in college, but sort of went with the flow of it, mm -hmm. and like, do you think how much impact could it make on someone's per professional life? as they graduate from college. And I kind of want to tie it back to how like the importance of passion is it, like kind of spending more time there. But do you think there will be a particular difference in the kind of trajectory you could have had graduating from college without sort of discovering that part of yourself and just living the clock work? Yeah, I, I think it is really important. One of the best pieces of, of professional advice I received was I was at some executive networking session and it was this guy who used to be a lawyer and all throughout high school and college, he was a tutor 
and he loved mm-hmm. tutoring people and he got, you know, he went to Harvard Law School, was like a corporate lawyer, you know, big shot. And one day he just realized that this wasn't what he wanted to do. So he quit. He founded his own uh, tutoring company, he became massive, you know, very successful guy. And I asked him, you know, what was your competitive advantage? You know, what helped you succeed? You know, there were other tutoring companies and what made yours better? And he said, you know, my passion was my competitive advantage. You know, I didn't mind working hard and people saw that I was really passionate about it and people are drawn to that. Mm-hmm. And so I think that passion can be a really strong tool in your toolkit. And if you don't, you know, discover what it is you want to do it. And I don't want to, you know, make it sound like I've got my life figured out. You know, it's not discovering like what exactly you know, you're going to be doing for the next 40 years, but just kind of honestly mm-hmm. asking yourself, do I like what I'm doing now? Is this something I want to keep doing now? Yeah. And I think, you know, just in a more applicable context, if you look at like an interview, you know, from my perspective, having interviewed some U of R students and other students for the analyst position, I think you can tell pretty easily when a student is, is genuinely interested in the type of work that analysis group does versus the type of student who just thinks AG is a good company and they want to work at a big consulting company. So they just walk into it. You know, you're going to come off as more genuine. You're going to not mm-hmm. mind studying for the, the interviews to know what's going on, stuff like that. So I, I think it, it can make a big impact. And so just knowing what you want to do, not only will it help you succeed, you know, you'll just be more personally satisfied, but even on a professional level, you know, people are drawn to, to genuine people who actually have an interest in, in the type of work that, that you're doing. So that's what I would say to that. Yeah, that's a, that, that's a really good insight. Um, I guess at the end of the day, it really shows that uh, who is really passionate and who is just kind of walking into it. Um, mm-hmm. And I'm, I guess you, uh, you've done a lot of career fairs at UFR, so you, I guess it kind of was kind of obvious to you as well, talking to students. Huh? It, it's, it's super obvious when a student comes up and like, wow, I'm a consultant. Like, that's really cool. Like, so you guys do securities fraud cases. Like, so <laughs> you look at this sort of thing. Yeah, you know, it sounds kind of nerdy, but you can tell it. And I love talking to those people and I love like explaining what analysis group is. And then you have students who come up and they see consulting. They go to vault and they see, maybe they do that. Maybe they don't. They see it's a big company, like, oh, a big consulting company. Let's, let's walk up and let's get it. <laughs> I don't like talking to those people as much. <laughs> <laughs> That's about as great as about those uh, consulting <laughs> folks. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, that, that, that's part of it. So, you know, I, I was one of those people too for a lot of times, you know, walking around figuring it out. Yeah. So not to disparage that group because I used to be a part of that group. What I'm saying is you, you can't be in that stage forever. And if you really want to make it to the next level, you've got to get to the point of, you know, knowing what you want and then, you know, combining that with doing the research on these companies to, you know, make yourself stand up. For sure, completely agree. All right, let's yeah. jump to the last segment of uh, the session. It is a rapid fire. Are you ready? Okay. I see. I see Pat I'm getting ready. up in his seat. He's like, "Oh my I'm God. sitting up, <laughs> sitting back." <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'll get it started, and then we'll jump on to your food. So the first question, Pat, is: What is your favorite travel destination? Uh, I like Mexico a lot. I've gone to Mexico a couple of times the last couple of years. Very close to the U.S., uh, very cheap, mm-hmm. very warm. I like Rochester. It's a great <laughs> spot. I think that's the first place I go as soon as the uh, pandemic um, kind of subsides a little. Gotcha. Nice. I'm right around nice. the corner. I'm in Texas. Ah, nice. <laughs> you, could, you could fix it up on your way. <laughs> yeah, I'll be driving uh, down from New York City. I'll, I'll grab you. <laughs> 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 that'll be that'll be quite a drive. Um, all right, Pat. Next one. Um, something that not many people know about you. That's tough. I feel like I'm on like a date right now. <laughs> not many people know about me. Yeah, it it, it is. I hope hope the date's gonna go well. <laughs> uh, I'm actually not really feeling a lot of chemistry. Unfortunately, maybe we should just be friends. Oh, just okay. <laughs> Um, I think maybe not a lot of people know that I'm kind of a nerd, not in the sense that I don't come off as a nerd because I do, but that yeah. I come off as a nerd because like I genuinely love like learning. So I spend a lot of time like reading. I love learning languages, stuff like that. So that might be something that people don't know. I may come off as a nerd just because I love to play video games, 
but there's also a good side of the nerdiness as well. So maybe that's my answer to that question. Wow. That makes sense. Um, yeah. yeah, you really flipped the table. It does feel like a date now. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me about yourself. <laughs> yeah, Pat, I, I, after that response, I kind of have my guards up right now. Just, <laughs> I, I need another glass of wine. <laughs> just to get started. Oh, right. uh, yeah. Okay, um, Pat, what superpower would you like to have? Uh, I think it would definitely take flight. Uh, you know, I've, I've spent a lot of time on planes. It'd be awesome okay. to kind of just do that. You know, I've always wanted to kind of get out, explore on my own. Invisibility sounds cool, but it's kind of creepy. You know, super strength. I don't really, I don't really need that. You know, my day-to-day -day life doesn't really help me. You know, I sit at a computer all day. Uh, mind reading, I feel like to be cool, but it's like a slippery slope. You know, you, you don't want to put that burden on yourself. You know, like, how can you build a connection <laughs> with someone if you can, like, read their mind? Um, yeah. yeah. So I think flight, just very innocuous, very cool. Let the government know right away. Uh, or maybe I wouldn't because they'd want to, like, conduct all these tests on me. <laughs> I can definitely see, like, some sort of, like, Amazon, like, original video. Like, <laughs> young 25-year-old in Brooklyn learns how to fly, hides from the government who's chasing after him to try to test him and like lock him in a government facility. Yeah. So that's tough. But assuming yeah. that the government would be cool with it, I think flight would be the one I would pick. Yeah. You don't yeah. airplane tickets anymore then. You can mm -hmm. just fly out to Mexico. Yeah, very mm -hmm. easy. Save a lot of money on fare <laughs> on uh, airplane tickets. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah. What is one of your fondest memories from college? I think it was the first time doing the like a big mock trial speech uh, my freshman year. You know, I was just very nervous. Mm -hmm. Practiced so much for it, so many hours standing in front of the year, in front of the mirror, like yelling at myself about how mm -hmm. this girl, you know, pushed this button to kill another person on a roller coaster. And so getting yeah. up and actually doing it, and the adrenaline was was so intense. I remember sitting down afterwards, my ears were like ringing, my heart was beating like a million miles a minute. Like getting through and actually doing it, and hearing like, "Hey, yeah, yeah. it wasn't great, but you actually did pretty well." Mm -hmm. uh, so that was one of my fondest memories because I remember being so nervous. I was just a very nervous public speaker. Um, so kind of just getting up and doing that for the first time, I think that's definitely one of my fondest memories. Well, I'm glad yeah. it wasn't me meeting your food. <laughs> <laughs> hey, well, that, of course, it was answer. second to meeting Sharfus. <laughs> that's when my <laughs> life really turned around. Yeah, that, that, that's how fast life got uncorked. That, that's how, that's how it all was. <laughs> all right, Pat, next one. Favorite thing about Bangladesh? Favorite thing about what? So, okay, favorite, favorite thing from your trip in Bangladesh? I think my favorite thing was we were in Argo's uh, village in Jashore, mm -hmm. near the, Jishore, you know, the, yeah. the border of India. And so we were at the, the tea stand. And we're sitting, having a cup of tea. And I think I was like the second white guy that ever had been to that village. So people would kind of like walk by and like do a double take. So like people would walk by and be like. <laughs> <laughs> and so it was really interesting, you know, just you know, being there and kind of like just immersed in the environment and, you know, connecting with people and you know, would sit down and you know, talk with them a little through Argo. It was really yeah. awesome. Did they take photos with you? Did they like pretend you're like a celebrity or something? No one took any photos, actually, and they all had iPhones. So I am a little offended. <laughs> 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 those are like not that's, those aren't the original iPhones, but they are still iPhones, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I right. said so last okay. one. All right. Uh, who is your favorite co-host, Sid or Shafuz? Hmm. It's a very intense competition going on, Pat. Yeah. You have like a leaderboard chart. Oh, really? That's interesting. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You, you can't you can mock trial this. You gotta pick. <laughs> I think I have to pick Sharp Foods. I'm sorry, Sid. Okay, like, per personal connection is completely aside. You know, this is like the first time we've we've ever met, and I, I'm not I'm not taking yeah. that into account. I like Sharp Foods' energy. He's got a little bit of a, a goofiness, and then kind of rides it. Yeah. You guys have like a very like a uh, Penn and Teller sort of vibe going on. You got Sid is like. The calm, you know, serious <laughs> one. 
and then Trifu was just kind of like goofing around, like, I didn't know you had to grind coffee beans. That's so <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I like that. <laughs> yeah, so, so that kind of goes into my point board. So I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. glad about that. I was, I was kind of trailing behind Pat, so mm -hmm. I appreciate I needed that. Ex I needed that point. Um, but, I got got it. It. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, Pat, thanks for being such a great sport. Um, and this was some really great, uh, this, this was really fun to. Uh, throw all these random questions at you and i think we're sort of end of our session and we don't want to keep you for too long on a saturday but i guess to wrap up with that what would be some of your recommendations that you might have for current students or also your early stage professionals especially um COVID has hit the job market and affected a lot of people would you have any recommendations as people are sort of searching for their professional goals either mm -hmm. a first job or trying to find a new job or people who got laid off what do you think yeah, so first of all, let me say that it's been a pleasure chatting with you guys. Uh, I know that this resource would have been helpful to me when I was a student. So I hope that this can help some people out there who are trying to figure out what they want to do in economic consulting, uh, maybe right for them. Uh, in terms of general goals, so just putting the pandemic aside for a moment, say you're you know a student right now, I think the biggest things you can do is, you know, if you want to get an economic consulting, keep the GPA up. Uh, do some research on the industry, you know, just make sure, you know, learn about the type of cases that these companies work on. And, you know, just try to connect with people, chat with people. I think networking is really, you know, people to say it all the time. You know, it's kind of like a, a trite phrase right now, like, oh, you, you have to network, but it, it really is important. So talking with people in the industry as well is really important. Uh, in terms of specifically the, the pandemic and people going through that right now with job loss, uh, I wish I had some good advice. You know, I mean, the honest truth is I'm, I'm not really an expert. You know, I got this job when I was a senior in college and I've just been doing that ever since. So I'm not really a wizard on, on the labor market. But I think if I would have any advice, you know, keep your head up. And I know it's difficult. Um, you know, just keep moving. Don't get discouraged. It is a numbers game. You just have to keep applying, applying, applying. I've had friends who have lost their jobs and then they spent all summer applying, and then I just had another friend of mine who just recently got another one. Um, so you, it does happen, you just have to keep trying. Um, I don't think I've got any specific advice. Yeah, I wish I could, but other than <laughs> keep your head up and, and keep applying, you know, because eventually one of those is going to work out. Yeah, Pat, I think that was. I think I think that itself was pretty pretty great, and it's. Uh, I really like how you kind of sort of focus on economics consulting, and uh, I think that's going to be very valuable for a lot of students, especially when analysis group goes back there again in the career fair. <laughs> so I hope they're going to be tuning on this video. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if we're actually going to the career fair this year. I, I would kind of doubt it. it. It's kind of weird. Our, our, our whole recruiting process now. And I guess another you know detail I can share for any seniors out there is that. Yeah, you know, a lot of companies don't really know what they're going to be doing with fall hiring, you know, analysis mm -hmm. group included. So yeah. I think we pushed our hiring timeline a little bit and mm -hmm. we'll probably be hiring uh, just a little less with everything going on. Um, so it's just like everything else, pretty uncertain. You know, so there's no set timeline out there. Uh, so yeah. you know, if you apply, that's good. You, know, you should apply. But I think casting a wide net is more important than ever. Absolutely. Yeah. No, thanks a lot, Pat. That was some really great advice. Um, but yeah, this is a, uh, was it, was that term called curtain? Something about curtains? Curtain closing closing curtain? curtain? I forget. Oh, uh, no. <laughs> curtain right. close? I, I, something. I don't know. Say so ticket. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. All right. Well, thanks so much, Pat, for uh, being here. I think it's awesome. Uh, we learned a thing or two about economic consulting, which is always awesome. And again, it's nice to be with a fellow UFR alum. Uh, for people tuning in, make sure to check out Patrick's uh, LinkedIn. So the first time I called you Patrick along the whole call. <laughs> yeah, I'm the one worst. That <laughs> was my bad. I'm so used to calling him Pat. I just wanted Pat. <laughs> I should have been Patrick. <laughs> But yeah, go follow him on LinkedIn. Uh, check us out on our LinkedIn page. Uh, we will be posting more such content. And closing thoughts from Shifu's or Pat? Yeah, Pat, again, thank you so much for the time. Really, really, I think this was really, really great. Uh, we had a lot of fun and really appreciate it. And looking excited to catch up with you in New York when I'm there again, uh, when the world is a little better. <laughs> uh, <but> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, excited to see that new place. Uh, but Pat, um, any closing thoughts to uh, wrap it up? 
Yeah, I think like I said earlier, um, great talking with you two guys. And you know, I hope this was helpful to someone out there at the U of R or otherwise who's interested, maybe just kind of exploring what they want to get into. And mm -hmm. I'm happy to chat, um, answer, you know, answer any questions. So you know, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn, shoot me a message. Awesome. Right. Thanks a lot, Pat. Hey, you. Hey, you. Yeah, you. We want you to join our community. You do? Join us by hitting that subscribe button to stay up to date with all the awesome content we have in store for you. Oh yeah, and one more thing. Make sure to smash that like button. No way, actually, destroy it. We're millennials, we love seeing likes. Catch you next time. Whoop-pow!